Ladies, gentlemen, and Haradrim of all ages, the Abattoir of Zir is finally with us, released and out, ready to be enjoyed. A lot of people went right in to get their hands on it when it came out last night. Others have been waiting patiently due to work or other obligations, but either way, what you are probably asking yourself is how do I take part in this activity and progress it as quickly as possible? And after a fair bit of testing, both by me and other members of the community, I've got your guide on how to approach the Abattoir of Zir. First things first, we should talk about the basics, just because I still see people confused about things like why they don't have access to the activity, you must have your season journey complete and you must be level 100. If both of those things are true, you will get a new seasonal quest popping up in Kedbardu to craft your first Bloodforge Sigil. This will cost you 800 Sigil Powder to do, which is quite hefty, but it also rewards you a lot of Sigil Powder on completion. If you are specifically looking to farm Sigil Powder for now for this activity, we will have a guide on that going up later tonight on the channel, as well as some other tricks to boost your efficiency pushing that activity. That said, once you have have your sigil, you use it, and then the portal will spawn in by the waygate in Kedbardu. You can also click on your map to teleport in from a distance, just like Nightmare Dungeons can. Once the first player loads into the activity then, the timer will begin at 10 minutes, and you'll be let free into a never-ending, procedurally generated hallway, essentially. One pathway, no windy, confusing circles, just continue along the forward path, killing every enemy in sight as quickly as possible without dying, trying to fill the bar on the right side of your screen before the timer in the same bar runs out. If you succeed at doing so, you'll spawn in the Guardians, which are three massive Bloodseeker elites with tons of health and lots of affixes. Kill them within the remaining timer and you'll succeed at the event, unlocking the next tier of the activity and getting some gear and a massive pile of Glyph XP to spend at the totem. Another thing to mention that we found out playing this in a group, if you reach the end of the little bar there, if you fill it up, but you're actually spread out as a group, the Bloodseekers will spawn on different players. We did it in a group of three, each Bloodseeker spawned each one on one of us, which means that you can actually spread them out if you want to and just take one 1v1s if you're in a group, and that could be easier to deal with, actually. But it's just a thing to be aware of if you're going to take this in groups. Basics out of the way then, now that we have had our own hands on with this activity in our own builds, what have we learned about how to approach it properly? Well, first things first, it's about the mentality. Tier 1 Abattoir of Zir is about the same difficulty as a Tier 100 Nightmare Dungeon, so if your build can do one of those, it can do the other. Unlike even a Tier 100 Dungeon though, Abattoir of Zir has a zero death limit, meaning even if you die once, the run is over and the the sigil is kaput, same thing if you're in a group, if anyone dies once, it's over. As a result, defense is more important than it is even in tier 100s. That said, Abattoir itself has a timer, unlike any other content in the game except for like world bosses, and so your damage is an actual requirement, not just something that's nice. In most activities, tier 100s included, if you are tanky enough that you can never die, you will eventually complete the activity no matter what. But Abattoir is the first endgame activity in this game that requires you to work out the actual correct balance of tankiness to damage to be able to just complete it in the first place. One general goal then is to hit 14,000 armor with disobedience functioning, which means that you want to be above 9,000 armor just sort of standing around out of combat. This should put you right around the maximum 85% damage reduction from abattoir enemies with disobedience doing its thing. On top of that, defensively, you want to of course have all of your resistances maxed out as much as possible. Past that, it just becomes a balance of your gear, of your skill points, of your paragon board. For example, Tybalt's Will are exceptionally strong offensive pants for pretty much every build in the game, but they also also take a slot that is normally very much more defensively sided, more defensively stacked. If you are dying repeatedly reaching your limit in Abattoir of Zir, the solution is to increase your tankiness, and so the answer might be to replace Tybalt's Will with something more defensive. If you do that though, you'll find that your damage will go down a lot, and if you suddenly aren't going to be able to make the timer because of that change, then that's too big of a swap. There will be a hard limit for most classes and builds as to how far they can push. Most people won't reach tier 25 ever, honestly, but that limit will depend on how good you are recognizing that balance shifting ever so slightly from tier to tier, and it will require you to understand your build enough to know what things you can shift around and how much of an impact each one of these will have. So the advice there, quite simply, is get comfortable with your gear. Know your build, know your secondary options, understand why your skill points go where they do, why your paragon boards are what they are, and know the priority order of what matters the most, and so you can learn how to adapt. You can know what to change based on how much of a difference you need to have, especially for anyone who just would normally just copy their build online without knowing knowing why their choices are made, and without really understanding what they're doing. So you need to actually understand this to be successful with this activity. The second major thing then is going to be the big reward for this activity, which you get upon first completion right away. The Tears of Blood Unique Vampiric Caragon Glyph. This thing is absolutely nasty, and it's even stronger than most people were predicting it to be, as the common belief was that it would only boost you per main stat spent in the radius, meaning specifically your class's singular main stat. But as it turns out, it is every one of the core stats 
in the game, meaning every stat node in the radius of this glyph will boost your damage multiplicatively. As a result, the way that we are thinking about this glyph in terms of our Paragon setup has changed dramatically as a result, and so there is a discussion to be had here about the best place to put it for each class and build. Put simply, there will of course be some variation in this due to individual builds, benefiting more from rare nodes in certain specific places that can be boosted by this glyph, but if you want to specifically maximize the damage part of the glyph itself alone and not think about anything else, by putting it in a location that has the most stack glyphs to activate and put points into in the radius, then these are the boards that you want to look at for each class. For Barbarian, it is the Carnage board. This doubles up really well anyways, as this puts damage while berserking and damage reduction from close enemies within the radius, which are the ones that you want to boost anyways. But this just has the most statistical nodes within the potential radius for this glyph for you to spend and boost the damage increase even further. For Druid, it's the Survival Instincts board. For Rogue, it's going to be the Cheap Shot board. For Sorcerer, it's the Static Surge board normally, unless you are running Fire Synergies and Burning Enemy Synergies, in which case it is instead the Burning Instinct board. Then for Necromancer, it's going to be the Flesh Eater board. Again, this won't be the tip top best for each specific build probably, as that is very general, and there's a bit more nuance to it for each of these classes, and of course for each individual build. But if you are looking for a quick fix solution to where to put that glyph the second you get it, until you work out the more neat and just sort of intricately correct spot, the more actually very, very detailed correct spot, those are going to be the top boards for each class for now, as far as number of nodes to boost the glyph itself, if you just want to stick it in somewhere and see the most effect. And it's worth mentioning that you can definitely feel the damage difference this makes in an absolute instant after slotting it in, and it's nutty how good it is. So it is without a doubt worth trying to complete tier one of the Avatar of Zir, even if nothing else, if you have no other care for the event, just so that you get that glyph and that power boost that it gives you for the entire rest of the season. No matter what else you're actually going to be doing with it, it is useful to have. As far as the Avatar itself then, the last pieces of advice that I have are pretty simple. The first is be aware of the Tears of Blood glyph, the new Paragon glyph. If you reach a tier of the Avatar that feels like it is hard walling you, just go back a few tiers into a comfortable territory and use those ones to farm glyph experience for Tears of Blood. Every 10 levels that you get on this glyph is a notable power spike, so every time that you get 10 more levels on it, it should boost your clear ability that much further and maybe let put you in a power level that lets you take on even further tiers. So if you do get truly walled and gear swaps aren't changing anything, skill points aren't changing anything, put some time into leveling your Tears of Blood glyph, especially early on in the levels, as these earlier levels will be quicker to get than the later ones. Then we should talk about more general strategies for things like the shrines that spawn in this activity. While you have no control over what shrine buffs do spawn or where they actually spawn within the dungeon, you do have power over how and when you use them, and there are some more intricate ways that you can choose to actually take advantage of them. Generally, from my own experience, in the first few tiers of Abattoir of Zir, the beginning mob clear section of the activity is not the difficult part. The hard part is the elites at the end. Most of us are built in a way where having more enemies around us simply makes your build stronger, makes you offensively better, and it also makes you defensively tougher due to things like disobedience or dots, things like that, and having less enemies around, therefore, is a bit harder. The Bloodseekers have obscene amounts of health, deal tons of damage, and have a large number of randomized affixes that makes them actually chunk you down harder than anything else in the dungeon will. And as a result, it makes them the least reliable part of a clear, the least comfortable part of a run of Avatar of Zir. Here you'll see an example of us actually using that to our advantage, knowing that fact, going out of our way to avoid using shrines as we're progressing through the start of the dungeon, and as we're about to proc the Bloodseekers actually coming in, we drag the enemies in front of us back through the area so that we can call the Bloodseekers in two feet away from a conduit shrine. That way when they spawn, we can activate it and use that to do massive damage while immune, killing off two of them for free. Then we drag the next Bloodseeker even further back in the dungeon to more shrines that we left behind. The Bloodseekers are the actively partist part of this activity, but if you can get through the first section in good time, you can use your remaining timer and abuse it to your advantage in ways like this that will only get more effective and intricate as people come up with more tricks over the coming days. Aside from that, all I have for you is that randomness really plays a large factor in this activity. Sure, it won't be a big deal if you are in a build capable of reaching tier 15s and you're in a tier 5, but RNG is easily enough in this activity to be the difference between a failure and a clear when you are reaching your limit. From RNG on the frequency of shrine spawns within the procedurally generated area, to the RNG of the quality of the buffs on the shrines that do happen, to the randomness of the affixes that spawn on any given elite that you can run into, and even more importantly, the affixes that spawn on the Bloodseekers at the end, because they are exceptionally harder than anything else within the dungeon. And they can actually get a ton of different affixes as well, and for some builds like Ball of Lightning, that can completely turn one of these places to dust normally. If you get Bloodseekers at the end with Suppressor, for example, you're just screwed. If you are running an ultra, ultra defensive 
a build with just enough offense to eke it out at the end and get through the timer, then you get Bloodseekers with the lifesteal affix, then you're obviously screwed because they will heal more than you damage them. But it can also go the other way, of course, and sometimes you'll get unnaturally easy Bloodseekers or just unnaturally favorable RNG leading up to them. The point being that as much as this activity has a lot of stable difficulty to it, it has a lot of skill because of the higher levels, you will have to dodge every single attack possible in order to survive. But there is still a lot of RNG once you start to reach the limits of your build's capabilities, and you shouldn't be disheartened if you just fail once. Sometimes you just need things to line up your way a little bit better. It is as simple as that. Other than that, remember what I said earlier about managing the balance of your gear and your build and just knowing when you need to lose some offense for some more defense and knowing how you can do that in the best way. And if you have that, you'll be fine. The way that it's looking at the time of me making this video, at least, Ball Lightning and Hammer of the Ancients are having a pretty good time. They're going to make it very far, especially once we start upgrading the Tears of Blood Glyph even more. But every other class, even the best builds for those classes, have already started to hit a struggle wall much earlier than they've actually wanted to. So basically, just don't be disheartened. This activity was made to be difficult. It was made to be something that we'd be able to progress for the rest of the season by upgrading the Tears of Blood Glyph. The scaling of the activity as well is experimental. They told us that as a fact. Be proud of how high you can reach and make sure that you focus on enjoying yourself above all else. After all, this is the biggest mid-season content drop that we've had. So let's all get the most out of it that we can and actually enjoy this new content. That said, the developers specifically told us this activity is a test for future endgame content. So if you have any issues with the difficulty or the scaling in any way, or if you actually really like the way that it works and you want them to know that, just make sure that you are vocal with your feelings about this activity one way or the other, because they are doing this with the specific intention of getting feedback for future actions they will take. They actively want to have your response, so let's just make sure that we give it to them, no matter how it is that you feel as an individual. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye